Hello, Global Gardeners. It's Monday. It's time to talk gardening. Great to see you all checking in from all over the world. Growing Spaces in the Netherlands is back. Always nice to see you here. Mark is in cold Wyoming. And of course, Coastal Crocus from Atlantic Canada. And then we can look forward to our wonderful moderators, Heidi and Jay. So let's get right to it. Today, I have a wonderful guest that I've been looking forward to having on the show for a long time. We have Ashley from Gardening in Canada, which is one of my favorite channels. Welcome, Ashley. Nice to have you here. Thanks for having me. So, Ashley, one of the things for the viewers who aren't familiar with the Growing in Canada channel that I like so much is that you are an actual certified and working soil scientist. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what that means? Yeah, so I guess it's kind of a broad term because when you go to school um, and when you graduate, there's so many different directions you can go into. So my graduating class is three people because <laughs> it's such an obscure degree. Um, and inside of that, you learn plant science, you learn soil science, and then just overall agronomy, food production, that sort of thing. Um, now, with that being said, I took the route of fertility, like soil fertility and fertilizer and that sort of thing. And I've worked in so many different, I've worked with inoculants. So breeding inoculants uh, to come up with strains that are good at uh, solubilizing phosphate in the soil or nitrogen fixing nitrogen um, specific to different legume breeds all in regards to like food production and farming so it wouldn't be like your, your garden varieties it would be more like chickpeas and lentils and, and that sort of thing and then on I a broad in, scale yeah like a big okay. farm scale yeah and then um pesticide research so certifications for um agriculture canada in my case but there's, you know, a whole bunch of tests that have to be done to see how it affects, you know, soil microbiology or um, health of even macrofauna in the soil, ants, that sort of thing, um, and what pesticides can do in that case. So I was part of research for that. And then I moved into breeding, like wheat breeding and that sort of thing. Um, again, all for large scale um, and coming up with varieties that, you know, are better at handling heat and better at making sure they don't fall over. We call it lodging, that sort of thing. And now I work just in fertilizer specific um, okay. and applicators. So very specific form of fertilizer and a very specific way of delivering fertilizer to the soil. So that's kind of what I do right now. My huge focus is my YouTube channel though. <laughs> <laughs> and trying to yeah. build that up. Um, so yeah, my career, I guess you could say, took like a little bit of a backseat. But yeah, so that's kind of what I do. Um, but there's so many different routes. So like one of my best friends who graduated with me, she works in environmental soil science. So she works with pipelines um, and stuff like that. And so hers is more so uh, looking at how and why it passes the pipeline would pass through a certain environment and how we can bring the soil back to its original state, make sure the native vegetation is there, et cetera, and so forth. So there's just so many different directions you can go with sure. us. You can even go in the direction of building. So uh, someone, an engineer is looking at building houses somewhere, you, that's the soil scientist looks at whether or not you can build on that soil or what soil has to be brought in to make sure you can build on that soil and etc and so forth so it's kind okay. of it's not as narrow as what people think it is <laughs> well no that's great though because that that gives you the the advantage of having that broad knowledge as you begin to apply it to the home garden setting and and yeah. being able to translate it that's one of the things i think you do really well is you translate that scientific information for the home gardener so that they can take that information and actually use it in a usable form in their garden. Uh, a lot of people are saying hello to you. I'll give a quick shout out to IV Organic and just a teaser, Charles from IV Organic is going to be a guest on the show next month. So that's always nice to, to see new people popping in. And I saw that we have in the garden with Eli and Kate 
uh, another recent guest on the show. So you can see this is a wonderful community where the guests end up being viewers after a while and, <laughs> and coming back. And, and so with that, that information that you have, that knowledge you have, and as we translate that, that agricultural, the commercial agricultural component into the home garden, Give me your your top or your top three or your top five, whatever you think is appropriate. But what are what are the things that for a typical gardener who wants to do the best for their soil that they really want, and they're beginning to like like me. I, you know, I preach that that the soil, good soil, is the key to gardening success, and that you really are growing your soil, and then the plants just happen and they do great because you've spent the time growing your soil so if if you're on the bandwagon that i'm trying to promote what are some of the things that you would say a gardener should do to get to that point that's a good question i think um i'm obviously biased in the sense that i think soil is very important i would say my first tip is don't get too hung up on what soil you have and whether or not you should be importing or you know building up or home culture or no dig don't don't overcomplicate it in that i think people would be shocked at how much a soil that most people would deem infertile can actually grow no problem um so i would actually get too hung up on that worst case scenario we build up with a raised bed it's really not that big of a deal um my second tip would be don't get too hung up on fertilizer i don't fertilizer is one of those things where you could add it you could not add it um you can do conventional you can do organic it really ultimately doesn't come down to it doesn't make a big difference in my opinion on a home gardening scale right so we're not doing intensive agriculture yeah. it's a home gardening scale um with that being said if you're going to use conventional or if you're going to use organic fertilizer, over application is a very real thing and you're going to do more damage than good. So people typically think the more nitrogen, the better. But it's not the case. <laughs> more disease, more pests. <laughs> and, it, and it really doesn't matter whether it's organic fertilizer or inorganic fertilizer, right? It just nitrogen is nitrogen as far you know the, the the nitrates as far as the plants are concerned and the soil microbes are concerned are all the same so if you think it's safer to add more organic fertilizer as opposed to synthetic fertilizer you're really missing the boat right oh yeah usually i mean uh, to put it into perspective if you were to give a soil scientist or any chem even a chemist someone who is you know living eating and breathing molecules we gave them nitrogen um, from an organic form and from uh, a synthetic form. And you said, what, where's this nitrate from? Where's this nitrate from? They wouldn't be able to tell you. They wouldn't be able to say, oh, that's from cow manure or that's from urea. They, they have no idea because it's, it is identical. The microbes even treat it the same. The microbes, how they go at it and that sort of stuff is the exact same. And I think it's important for people to know it, uh, in particular right now with the rise of inoculants so you have phosphate solubilizing bacteria is you know slowly starting to come onto the market and starting to see it more and more which is exciting um you have your mycos which is a phosphate solubilizing uh bacteria technically or uh, fungi in that case and then you also have like the rhizobium so if you're doing peas or beans and you're using inoculants um that yeah. nitrogen fix so all of these things are designed to help a plant uptake these nutrients when those nutrients are not readily available in the soil. So it's either going to fix it from the air or in the case of microbes and fungi, it's going to solubilize it from the soil. And I think it's important for people to remember that if you're also jumping on uh, compost and even synthetics, that what ends up happening is those symbiosis, they don't even form because the plant isn't calling out for that symbiosis. The plant is in need for that nutrient. So if you are using what we call inoculants, which is any form of bacteria or fungi or whatever, that is going through and actually working with the soil and the air to capture nutrients, you're adding fertilizer, you're pretty much throwing your money out the door because yeah. 
there's just no need for it, if that makes any sense. So. Oh, it makes sense to me. I actually have a video where I talk about that and saying that you're wasting your money if, if you're buying a lot of those things and incorporating them into your soil. Uh, and, and so speaking of inoculants from a slightly different perspective, Idaho Gardener's asking, does your degree include compost and making soil and what might be a good inoculant to add to a lazy pile to get it going after a long winter? Yeah, good question. Um, so no, <laughs> I mean, not directly. <laughs> I guess like technically there'd be divisions that would be looking at that sort of thing. Um, what I will say is for inoculating a compost pile in general, a good rule of thumb is to get a local biodiversity. So when we import strains, because I worked with strains from all over the world, <laughs> uh, when we import strains, we find that some will not overwinter in specific climates, or some won't survive the summer in certain climates because of heat and cold and so on and so forth. Yeah. So I think rather than purchasing something, your best bet is to actually go locally into a different ecosystem. So you're in pretty much the prairies where I am, and that extends in the Great Plains extends into the US. So a lot of people fall under this as well. It'd be a good idea to go get a prairie soil sample, um, an aspen bluff soil sample. If you're near the boreal forest, go grab a boreal forest soil sample. It doesn't take much at all, like a teaspoon, <laughs> and that's it, and tossing that in your pile. Yeah, so, so what you're saying, if you have the opportunity to live in an area with a different type of soil, like near a forest, you just go up with a, a bag and scoop up a little bit of that soil, bring it back to your garden, and then start incorporating that into, into your beds. But should you do it through the compost first or put it directly into the soil of your beds? You can do either or. I mean, the the if you put it in the compost, you're giving it more food, technically. It depends. Like, if you're doing a hot compost, you could obviously damage some stuff. But if you're at the end of the composting phase and you're in the curing phase, you still have a lot of organics in there that those microbes could feed on. So if you're looking for rapid colonization, throwing it into the compost pile is definitely going to help. Um, but in the, the soil itself, I mean, it's going to help as well. We are starting to realize in like the field of soil science um, that there's kind of almost a dead zone in urban areas when it comes to soil market biology. So there are some microbes that we see in native pastures and farmlands even that we don't see in the urban uh, environments. And we don't know exactly what that is, but one of those is yeast. So yeast is um, something that we don't often think about when we think about soil science. But it turns out that it's a huge food source for bugs, like little microbes. And so when we run out of, you know, nitrogen or phosphorus or whatever the case is, uh, microbes will often lean on yeast to um, eat away at. Um, and nematodes, like predatory bugs yeah. that actually prevent thrips and nematodes and that sort of thing, when they run out of food, um, that pest they'll they go and eat yeast. And so that's one, again, that compost or soil, if you wanted to encourage more microbe activity, the incorporation of yeast could help. And so what I do is I've expired yeast from baking it goes in my compost. Okay. So so that that actual baking yeast is 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 good yeah. enough to throw into the soil. Yeah, kombucha too is another one. Okay. Like if you have a lot of excess scooby there's, I think I did a, I looked it up, I, I did some research on like what exactly is in uh, kombucha. There's three forms of yeast that are technically soil yeast um, and like something that soil microbes would recognize. So I started throwing my kombucha to be the compost too. And it works. Yeah. Well, that's nice. Cause especially if it gets so big and you end up splitting it into smaller pieces anyway, you've got something to do with all that, that, that yeah. leftover. I like that idea. I haven't done that before. Interesting. Uh, Tennessee Nana is asking a question about using alfalfa tabs sold for horse feed. And so um, I've talked a little bit about this in the past where, um, you know, alfalfa being a nitrogen source for 
uh, soils or for the compost pile. So um, what's your take on doing something like uh, animal feed, like an alfalfa pellet to help boost your soil? Yeah, I've seen that alfalfa pellet uh, specific for like mulch and you wet them. They're specific for gardening though. I don't, and I can't comment on um, the horse feed. I don't know what's in it. Like, I don't know what additions are added to it, if those additions would be harmful or not harmful. So it's really hard to say. I mean, if it's alfalfa and it's just dried balls of alfalfa and that's what the labeling says, like, yeah, fine, you could, you could use that um, as a mulch or whatever the case is. My only hesitation would be uh, not, making sure it's not incorporated. So you're not incorporating materials that have not yet been decomposed and eaten away at, for lack of a better term into your soil because um, that can pose an issue in regards to microbes then competing directly with plant nutrients with plants, which is obviously not ideal. Yeah. Now, I don't mean to pick on Shanine, but they say, just make sure you realize that the soil underneath pine trees is very acidic sometimes. I use pine needles a lot, but I mix them with other things. So let's talk about the acidity or lack of acidity under pine trees that is caused by pine needles. Yeah, so um, there's been a lot of like early research that was done on this back in the early 1900s, I guess you could say, um, because people were noticing that pine trees in an urban landscape, nothing was growing underneath them. And that actually comes down to not so much the acidity as it does the shading. So the, the trees themselves are very cylindrical and uniform and close to the ground. And we don't typically see that with other trees unless they are like a bush or something like that. And if we were to look under a bush or um, you know something that has that foliage lower to the ground, we would notice that nothing's growing under that either. So shade is one factor that is the reason why pine trees don't um, have plants growing under them or grass in some cases. And the second one is mulch. So the pine needles that fall off the plant can be quite heavy. Uh, I'm talking inches in some cases, depending on how big that tree is. And so it's actually performing the same way as a regular mulch would, whether you're using grass clippings or leaves or wood mulch. And it's just choking out plants entirely. Not that the soil underneath isn't worth anything. It's just it's choking the plants out. And then the third factor that they determined for the reason why pine trees aren't growing has nothing again to do with the acidity. It actually is the roots. So they don't have a classic, you know, tap root that digs deep. They are a very superficial root system. So if you go into the boreal forest and you go into where a lot of these trees are native to, they are the water table is really high. So they'll grow in bog environments or next to bog environments. And so their roots going deep doesn't make sense for them. They're more of a surface root plant. And so because of that, they tend to erode soil or soil erodes very easily, which ultimately um, makes it so that it's not ideal to put anything there. So. Yeah. And I've actually read up some studies here in Colorado. We, for the most part, much of the state of Colorado has alkaline soil and we've got lots of spruce and fir and pines and the soil underneath all of our conifers is no more acidic than any of the other soil in the surrounding area so you know actual soil tests here in colorado that show it doesn't acidify the soil just because you have a, a conifer growing great mulch though like if you're oh, looking yeah. for a weed barrier <laughs> I save like Christmas trees every year and like knock all those pine needles off of them because yeah, good mulch. Yeah, my neighbor has a whole bunch. In fact, this is a picture of my garden in the background. You can you can kind of see one of the pines right there and there's a bunch. And uh, every year when they're raking up their yard, it's like, give me, give me, give me. Yeah. I want as many pine needles. And they're, they're glad because they don't have to carry them to the curb. They can just toss them over the fence and I use the pine needles throughout my garden. I, I think it's a great mulch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so back to the original question, what other tips would you have about the the improvement of soil? So we talked about not getting intimidated by what 
your current situation is in regards to the soil you do have. We talked about not, you know, getting too hung up on fertilizers and the amount, the volumes, and et cetera, and so forth. Um, I think the the third tip is to not get hung up on modality. So don't get hung up on thinking, I got to pick the best modality. So I am uh, tillage versus no-till, uh, no-dig with strike compost versus in ground gardening, raised beds versus agriculture, container versus, <laughs> I yeah. just like don't do what works for you and in your um, scenario. So I guess with that being said, look at the original reasons why some of these were designed. So for example, no dig was designed initially for soils that were very heavily compacted to the point that you need to pick pickaxe to get into. So if you're in that scenario, then yeah, you should consider that. Hoga culture was designed for elderly or for people who, you know, didn't have the ability to dig holes or to, you know, get into the ground. That may be a consideration for, for you in that case. But don't uh, don't get too hung up on thinking you're doing it wrong if you're tilling. I that's not a thing. It's a tool. It's a tool in your arsenal. And so if you have to use the tool to be successful, then you have to use the tool to be successful. And so in a lot of cases, I find people will, you know, right away latch onto the fact that you're a bad person if you tell. And that's just simply not the case. It's like yeah. literally the most, the worst information my... gardeners have ever been given. I still have my tiller in my shed. Now, I, I do most of my gardening these days with uh, the raised beds, but I'm not getting rid of my tell tiller just in case there comes a time that that I need to use it. So I completely agree with you. I, I think garden shaming is, has become too prevalent and we, we all really do need to just do what's best for us. And you might not agree with the way someone else is doing it, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong, especially if they're having success with it. Yeah, I mean, like at my my at our farm so i i garden urban urbanly and then i also we have a farm where we we garden as well and out on the farm it's like kind of near a swamp and it also has mole activity so like that's okay, a scenario yeah. where i till because if you have really saturated soil that stays saturated for too long tillage will help eliminate that and then on the other side of it if you have voles like rodents you know eating your root crop and such tillage again is another great tool to you know scare them off for lack of a better term mm. so i am i am a soil scientist and i still <laughs> there's areas that i tell now not everywhere but like definitely if it's needed it's a tool i take out for sure yeah especially with some of those those um pests that are laying their eggs and you've got the the grubs that are overwintering you know, when I have someone ask me a question about that, that they have one of those kind of pests and they're trying to figure out how to get rid of them, that's one of the things I say. Disturb the soil. Dig up those those grubs, especially if you've got chickens. <laughs> you know, dig up the soil a little oh, yeah. bit and those chickens are going to deal with that pest before they can ever become an adult. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So for those of you who are just now joining us, uh, we're talking about soil, of course, and the magic in soil, because I think it's more than the magic of soil. I think soil really is magic because of what it is and what's inside of it. And we're talking to Ashley from the wonderful YouTube channel that I just love, Gardening in Canada. And so that's what the topic is today. Throw your questions out at us and we'll we'll keep discussing the the soil and so yeah let's let's shift a little bit and we can keep throwing out all the tips you want all day long but but the the magic in soil and the way i like to say it that way you know we can make all the the comparisons that we want as far as you know there are there's more soil in the scoop you take from the garden and there are stars in the galaxy and all those kind of wonderful ways to visualize. How do you like to describe it? When you talk about the life within a soil, give us a visualization of, of Ashley's perspective. Yeah, I think um, one of the most powerful ways to look at it is if you were to take your pinky nail and you were to scoop up soil from that 
there's more microbes and living things in that pinky of the soil than there are uh, human beings on Earth and that will ever be on Earth, which is shocking, which is shocking. <laughs> uh, but with that being said, people will often think like, oh, there's dead soil out there. There's, there's no dead soil. <laughs> there's no thing, such thing as dirt. People will call things dirt. It's not dirt. <laughs> It might just be dormant, but like very rarely is the soil completely dead because of that reason. It's such a, it's one of those things that people always talk about, oh, when the world ends or an asteroid hits or climate change takes us out, whatever you believe in, everything will be gone except for, and they'll say like crocodiles, for example, soil. <laughs> soil is alive and it is not leaving, like it literally never leaving. So that's yeah. great. That's great. And so um at as we're as we're improving our soil so dr elaine ingham whom i'm sure you're familiar with you know the the soil food web and and she has her school to, to, to teach soil and one of the things that i've seen her advocate even at the home gardener level though most of her focus is on the industrial agriculture is to get a microscope and to actually take your soil and put it under a microscope so you can see what you have in your soil and also identify any deficiencies in the microbe activity in your soil. Personally, I think that's a little bit of overkill. I don't think most gardeners can really benefit from taking that scientific a, a view in improving their soil. So where do you fall on that spectrum as far as as taking that scientific interest in your own soil. Yeah, so um, I her background is microbiology, so she's uh, that's her that's her thing. And I think uh, people get confused when people who work with soil or work in food production they say one thing and they're very dogmatic about it. So they'll say like microbes are the answer to everything, and then the chemist soil person is going to be like. The secret to everything is your pH. And so everyone has like a, and then there's the physical, like the physics science people, soil science people. So actually there's different like uh, professions within soil science. None of them, in my opinion, is 100% correct and none of them is 100% wrong. Now, the way that she does it with a microscope and um, actually physically looking at moving nematodes and uh, microbiota and stuff, that is not something that we did in universities. So uh, I've worked in a microbiology lab and actually our way of looking at soil and what was in it, whether it was healthy or unhealthy, was uh, petri dishes. So that was okay. how we looked at it from an uh, industrial standpoint. And then you would look on your petri dish to analyze how many colonies you had and et cetera and so forth. Um, and that typically needs less training because it's super obvious on a petri dish what's fungus and what's bacteria and blah, 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 blah. Uh, that's actually how penicillin and antibiotics and stuff yeah. is designed yeah. from soil microbiologists yeah. screwing around with petri dishes. <laughs> so uh, that's like been the classic way of looking at soil microbiology for ever and it still is the norm for looking at soil microbiology um but from a, a, a home gardener perspective i don't like people to get too hung up on that um i would prefer people just do like the underwear or the sock test that would be like my preferred method yeah um so that one is just you take organic cotton or cotton in general sock or underwear and you or t-shirt or whatever it is it doesn't really matter and you weigh it, so you would weigh the total weight of it. Um, you'd mark it down somewhere, and then you'd put it in the ground. You can put it at different depths. So typically speaking in a garden, your first two inches are your most active because it has the most oxygen. If you're worried about compaction and lack of microbe activity deeper down, you could put it pretty good deeper down, but just be aware it is not uncommon for something to decompose sl slower the deeper it gets in the soil system, even in natural soil systems, not, yeah. this is not exclusive to gardening or production of food at all. Um, so you toss that in and then you'd once a month, you could do it every two weeks, but you probably won't see much after two weeks. You'd mark up the spot. You dig it back up and then you'd reweigh it. And then you just, you 
it's actually you're determining whether or not it's decomposing or it's going down in decomposition okay. level. And, and the yeah, rate and then, of decomposition. Yeah, yeah. And if it's gone by the end of the summer, it's a good sign that you have a healthy soil. If you have the same stock at the end of the year with very little to no decomposition, you know that you need to work on your microbes or your soil health, whether that be addition of oxygen or whatever the case is. So um, that's what I would do okay. first and foremost. Um, and then if you're, so like the way oxygen is typically the first and foremost way to increase microbe activity. So if you have like a heavily compacted soil or a soil that doesn't have a lot of aggregation in it, okay. your first uh, thing to look at is compaction. And so just taking a coat hanger and actually like shoving the coat hanger in the ground and marking where you got to with a piece of tape and then keeping that coat hanger in the yard and then retesting throughout the entire year to see if you can get that deeper is, you know, going to be important. Um, and then ultimately the goal is to get it, you know, at least a foot into the ground of just with ease. Like it shouldn't take much to get it that far. And then, you know, okay, I've, I've, got, I've alleviated some compaction. I've, you know, helped with oxygenation. And then typically if you can get that under control, then that sock or the underwear will really quickly be into the and so when you're testing, particularly the compaction using the, the coat hanger, uh, should you test with dry soil or wet or moist soil? Dry. Okay. Yeah, I would go dry. Um, moist, it tends to go in easier. Yes. And so it's not super accurate. Uh, now, with that being said, just a general test, as long as you're doing it the same way every time is what it comes down to. So. You want to do it after you water because that's what's going to help you remember to test the compaction after you water then do it at that time right so well yeah the reason i ask is i have an incredibly dense compacted soil and i test it like that when it's dry because i can i can't get it in and so that's a really good way for me to see the improvement because when it's moist even my compacted soil <laughs> I, well, I can push it right in. So it, it actually gives me some misleading results depending on where I yeah, test it and yeah. when I test it. And I've yeah. shown that in some videos in the past, just how hard it is to dig in my soil, which is, again, why I do a lot of rice bed gardening. Uh, so Jeremy's asking the question, uh, thoughts on the, the JDAM method. And so th did this originate in Korea? I know it's, it's associated mm -hmm. primarily with Korean um farming but what can you tell us about that i believe it was a scientist um that put it together and i believe he was from south korea and uh, my understanding about why that method was put together or the brainchild behind it was because they had a lot of well they've always had a food waste issue in south korea it's actually to the point that um the electric compost that we're seeing in the market right now those were first designed way back when, like 30 years ago by South Koreans, because they have a mandate that anything organic cannot be thrown out. So one of the solutions to this was brought forward by this gentleman who made the JDA method. And that was because it could be kept in a small apartment type uh, environment and then kind of dumped outdoors into or uh, used in an outdoor setting for these plot gardens and stuff that they had. So that was kind of the brainchild behind it. I would argue it's probably one of the first forms of compost that was only very specifically designed for gardeners, if that makes any sense. It wasn't yeah. designed initially for large scale farming or market gardens. It was designed for gardeners. So in that sense, that's really good. Um, I'm not super familiar with the particulars on how it works, but my understanding is that it's an anaerobic uh, composting method. So without the presence of oxygen, which is totally fine. And then it's trenched into the soil. So you're yeah. burning it into the soil. Now, I don't know um, the depth or the recommended depth for the burying of it. But typically speaking, if we take something that's best colonized in lack of oxygen, and we introduce it to oxygen, we tend to kill off the microbes, and then vice versa, if we have an anaerobic environment, and now 
the net bacteria thriving in that environment, and then we give it a big boost of O2, we tend to, again, kill off a lot of those microbes. Now, that's not saying that this isn't going to work. It's just saying that if we're going to do the trench after, or we're going to bury the, the produce after, you want to make sure it's at a depth um, and densely packed in the sense that it continues in that anaerobic environment. So it can continue the decomposition process that it was naturally meant to do. I did, so I started doing Bokashi because I find it very easy in Canadian winters. You can see it's my pile right now with a frozen block. <laughs> There's no getting nothing into it. So I've been doing uh, Bokashi and I really, I do enjoy it. Um, and I've been trenching it in. I find that it decomposes just fine. Uh, I don't know, again, if I saw, in my opinion, I don't think I saw any like spectacular results from it or anything hugely notable, but I, I think it's always a good idea to try different composting methods, regardless of what you're doing. Um, and, and that, the reason for that really truly comes down to biodiversity, whether it's JDAM or it's uh, worm composting, biodiversity is key. And if you can give your garden a different source of compost or microbial activity, you're just increasing the number of microbes colonizing in there, and, and that's never a bad thing. So, yeah, no, it's a, it's a good method. I just, I don't think any method is like anything to write home about. I would never be like, this is the only method I'm using for going forward. I've never seen that before. And, and that's the biggest issue I have with it. Um, JDAM and even Bakashi to a certain degree has reached a point that you have the, the. I'll, I'll use experts as a, a loose term because I don't think they're necessarily experts. They're just the ones who are the first to tell everybody about it, and, and they have their recipe of how to do it. And you know, one will say it has to be rice holes, and so then you have a gardener who is trying to search to find rice holes. To practice this particular method of composting and the time and expense to do some of these yeah. methods i think really does a disservice for the home gardener who yeah. can compost anaerobically much simpler without having to buy some concoction or some ingredient that someone else is saying you have to do if you're going to follow that particular method. So that that's the biggest yeah. issue I have with it is that you can follow, like you say, the 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 diversity of methods, and you can understand the concept behind the anaerobic breakdown of material, be it Bokashi or JDAM. And if that's what you want to do, great. And, and especially for for small gardeners and container gardeners who can't have a compost pile, I think it can be quite effective, but uh, yeah. I'd spend so much time getting the aerobic life in my soil that I'm resistant to incorporate a whole bunch of anaerobic life right next door. Yeah, yeah. And that's like the only thing that I kind of get hung up on. It's like the same ideas when uh, people use like molasses or sugar water and they'll use it for the purpose of increasing microbe activity in either their compost or in their garden. Um, and yeah, like it, it does, it's a known fact that that increases the micro populations, maybe not diversity, but for sure the populations, yeah. uh, it's the same as anything. If you give something a food source, it's going to multiply and it's going to multiply quickly and microbes are known to multiply every 20 minutes. So you're going to see a massive influx. And then once the food source is gone, it's just all going to die off again. And the only supporting theory, the only supporting theory that I can maybe kind of be like, oh, okay, I kind of see where you kind of at with that, is now you have a whole bunch of dead micro bodies, and so then those microbes can feed on the dead micro bodies. So that's like the only thing. So you might elevate it slightly, and you might be able to maintain it elevated for a small period of time, but ultimately it's just going to come back down. If the food source isn't there, the food source isn't there. So yeah, I think that um, JDAM and like the sugar water molasses. Um, overdoing anything i mean yeah I, i'm not an advocate of the, the sugar water you know i've seen, seen some stuff like you know backstrap molasses or blackstrap molasses you know and it's high in sulfur and some other compounds and that might have some benefit that hasn't thoroughly been researched but just the sugar water um and, and i read something recently because because i've been saying it's a waste of time but 
yeah, it creates a lot of dead bodies for those other microbes to eat, which is not necessarily a bad thing. So I've kind yeah, of backed that's off literally, on like zero it's tolerance. It's like a loophole. It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like the loophole. People will be like, oh, that's it. I gotta, I gotta do a video on that. But it's like, yeah, okay, fine. But at the same time, it's like, no, it's yeah, not there's quite. Zero if ways you really look at the big picture. So. so Dusty Flats is asking, we, t we talked a little bit about the mycorrhiza and uh, I have, I've, I've made a video in the past that, that said, you're wasting your time if you buy the mycorrhiza and put it into your soil, you are better suited to go to the forest or underneath the trees that are near you, dig up some of that soil, and then what's growing in your region has already been proven to survive in your region because... My winters, like your winters, are cold. And if I'm buying something from someplace else and incorporating it, who knows if it's even going to live the first day. But that's how I look at it. What What are your thoughts? It, it is a craze. And so is it worth it? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this is funny because I studied this, um, studied this quite a bit, actually, uh, in university and in my job. So... The, the craze is backed by science now. One of the things that we would con constantly look at and something that soil scientists were completely obsessed with is the relationship. So these mycorrhizae, whether they're endos or ectos, have a very specific relationship with a very specific plant. So every ecosystem tends to have their own mycorrhizae, and that mycorrhizae is very specific to forming a relationship with that plant based on the exudates that that plant releases, the roots and just the, the format of the root biomass below ground, combined with a lack of phosphorus in the soil bioavailable phosphorus, so it's uh, pentaoxide is, phosphorus pentaoxide is what it comes down to. So, which is two phosphorus, five oxygen. Um, now, if you have phosphorus in your soil, that's strike number one. So phosphorus okay. in soil, in general, in North America, is very high because it's one of those nutrients that tends to stay in situ pretty darn good. So that's strike number one. You are unlikely to get any sort of symbiosis. So you're throwing your money down the drain. Strike number two is that the in industry versions of mycorrhizal fungi that I've seen are usually one strain. And I, oh, I can't remember what it's called now. I did a, a video on it, but it's, it's a generic one. It's a specific species. And so it's, able to capture the roots and symbiosis with a very large number of plants but not all so i find that it doesn't particularly capture well for um anything that's not a tree or a bush so bush species whether that be caragana or lilacs or raspberries or blueberries tend to do well trees uh, apple trees decorative maples, you name it, also tends to do pretty good. Grocery store produce type stuff, tomatoes, cucumbers, that sort of stuff, not so much. Not as good of a relationship. So I think the, they put it, the stuff out. And Mycos, uh, or Mikes, it's M-I-K-E-S. It's made by Pro Mix, I believe is the maker of it. There's blue green and red containers and on each one of them it says for shrubs and then the other one says for garden parties and one says for flowers all the same strain of okay. excellent fungi. so it's kind of funny because they market each one different they're all the same price but they're all the same species one species so um yeah so there's that and house plants i haven't seen any that are particularly good at symbiosis with house plants either um and cannabis is another one. So I mean, at the at, but like overall, there's they're starting to 
come up with more strains and they're starting to colonize more strains and put those into mixes with the mycos. Um, there also, if you, you look in your mycos packages, you'll start to notice that they're starting to incorporate more uh, rhizobium bacteria and they're starting yeah. to put in more bacteria than fungi. And that's because bacteria in particular doesn't necessarily need the symbiosis unless if it's, um, it is the, the rhizobium, then yes, it would. But Trigoderma, for example, uh, different ones, they tend to just solubilize nutrients and do their thing regardless of what's, what the plant's doing or what the plant's calling out for. So those are becoming more and more important, but I, I think ultimately it's not quite quite there yet for uh, home gardeners. Now, yeah. if you're doing like a fruit forest, like in bushes and trees, yeah. I would use it. I think it's a good addition. Um, but if you're doing like tomato plants and stuff, I'd probably back off on it just for now. If you're doing legumes, if you're doing legumes, get our isobium inoculate. Mackenzie Steve used to make one. It was wonderful. I yeah. loved it so much. Now I can't find it. <laughs> so I don't make it anymore. So if you can find, if anyone knows of a good rhizobium bacteria and oxalant, please let me know in the comments because I'd be interested. Um, and that one, you can right away see if your money's paying off. So at the end of the year, you can pull out your legumes and you can look at the nodulations on the roof. Yeah, and, and you can know. see those nodules staring you in the face with those big... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so like you actually have like a measurable way to see if your inoculums did anything for you which is i mean with mycos it's if you can't unless you're going to sit out there with like a sheet of some sort of clear plastic you need to dig a hole and you know what i mean like it's very yeah. difficult to tell um because you got to dig through it and then you're gonna disrupt the hyphae and then it's really really tough to tell if you if you got any action from it but um, you can try it, see how it works for you. Generally speaking, though, I rarely see a garden soil test that's showing low in phosphorus. And so because of that, I don't, you're, you're wasting your money. Okay, good. And, and so uh, back to the, the legumes and getting all that, that bacteria action to, and the inoculation. Um, what, I've, what I've done, and it seems to have worked out for me, it, most of my garden plants will go into my compost pile. But when I have those wonderful nodules that are showing all the life, I will take those and bury them into other beds with the idea being that I'm inoculating as many beds as I can once I found a successful inoculant. What do you think of that idea? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, the bacteria is there. And then on top of that, you also have uh, quite a bit of nitrogen in that area as well. So yeah, no, that's uh, that's actually what soil scientists like when we're trying to colonize something on a large scale to put it out to production to make it a sellable, retailable product. That's exactly what we're doing. Cool, cool. So uh, Sarah is wondering about the sugar solutions adding to a compost pile to get it kick started after a cold snap and to get it heated up in spring. So we talked about adding the sugar water to, or the molasses or, you know, some variation to soil and what it does. So is there much difference in the compost pile if we're doing the same thing? Uh, no, it's the same uh, type scenario. I mean, you could argue that it's even worse of a choice only because you're technically substituting the food source. And so the microbes are always going to go for the easier food source and the easier food source in that case is going to be the sugar, not the plants. And so they'll be decomposing the sugar water. They won't yeah. be decomposing the plants. Um, now, with that being said, you're going to have a massive influx of microbes that then are going to be looking for food after they've decomposed all the sugar. So if you did like a one-time application, then technically it could speed things up because you're just going to have a bigger army. Is yeah. kind of what that comes down to. But there's no guarantee that that army is going to flawlessly and easily transfer over to a harder form of sugar, which to metabolize would be kind of the argument there. Um, it's it's so funny because we talk about soil and like soil microbiology, like we know what we're, what we're talking about. Um, but scientists really, we don't understand soil, I mean, at all, really, when you, you start really breaking it down. 
Um, so even saying that, you know, sugar, which the, it could be different bacteria. It could be different yeah. microbes entirely that eat the sugar versus the plant. And so like, is that influx going to affect the decomposition rate? It's so impossible to tell. And then it's another case where you'd need a controlled environment to even know if what you did was faster. So if you yourself could be like, oh, I did sugar water the first part of the season, I got compost in three months. I uh, didn't use sugar water, I got compost in six months. Well, was your compost pile drier? Was it hotter? Was it colder? And like all these factors play into it. So it's yeah. so, that's where gardening, it, it sucks, but we don't have the, the resource or the, the money to put into, you know, necessarily heavy duty forms of research for this sort of thing. So that is kind of where gardeners have to be a little bit of their own scientists and see what works for them. And if you find that sugar water does, for whatever reason, increase or expedite the process for you, then that's not a bad thing. It's the same thing as uh, I find there's, you know, some weird concoctions on the internet that start going viral, like uh, plankton, mm -hmm. for example, or phytoplankton, uh, big additive uh, that kind of went viral there for a little while, or blue-green algae. Um, and people say, no, 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 I saw results. I got my, I, my yields increased, my plants increased, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes I often think to myself, like, okay, what, what happens when I get a new product, when I get a new garden gear or a new whatever? And I'm, I want to use it. <laughs> so now suddenly, instead of watering my plants once a week, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to water my plants once a day or exactly. uh, every, once every three days. And so it's like a placebo. And so you see these really good results and it's like, look at it, it's working so good. But it's the reality is, is that you're just choosing to water with sugar water. And now you're actively thinking like, oh, I got to water my compost again. I got to water my compost again. So now you're watering it when typically you would have just left it for a month and been like, oh, compost, that needs to be moist, what? <laughs> Yeah, so, that's one um, of my my basic philosophies is that a good garden grows where a good gardener goes. And it's <laughs> that thought. If you think you're improving your plant life with any product, just by you having that knowledge and taking that action and seeing what happens, that means you're spending more time out in the garden. You are watering your plant more often. You're probably picking the pests off on a more regular basis. And and you credit whatever that concoction was that you poured on the plant. And I think most of the time it's just the fact that you are physically in your garden more often because you've taken that corrective action. Yeah, yeah I think it's more the person than it is the product. And, you know, back to the idea of compost, if you've got a cold pile and you want to jump start it, I think it's a better idea to turn the pile, get some oxygen in there, make sure that it hasn't dried out over the winter, get that, that moisture level up to where it should be. And, and then it, it may, the problem I have at the end of the winter is my pile's always dried out. And so I now need to incorporate more nitrogen to kickstart it and get it growing again so it's it's not so much the sugar again it's the idea if you're going to be adding sugar water to your compost pile you're probably going to be turning the pile and adding moisture to the pile and getting it kick-started naturally and it's not necessarily the the sugar that you added that made all of that happen yeah and if it's going to help you get there like if it's going to help you remember to do it then add your sugar water <laughs> it's not going to hurt anything <laughs> You know, so. Uh, exactly. And Shandy's Garden is actually saying, now I'm considering pouring all my old hummingbird nectar with all the dead ants in it over my compost. I change them yeah. twice weekly. And that's actually, yeah. I think you're probably getting more benefit from the dead ants than you would be getting from the sugar water. But yeah, absolutely. Rather than just toss it, add it to the compost pile. Add it to the compost, yeah, 100%. Yeah. There, there's going to be yeah. something that will benefit, some microbe that will enjoy it. Um, and, and so here's an interesting idea, because I do this as well, but even though sometimes I, you know, think it looks bad. Sherry's saying, I've been getting a kick out of finding pieces of corn tortilla I put in the compost pile all over the yard. Somebody's doing nachos when I'm not watching. So uh, the idea of, again, adding all kinds of things to the compost pile, not all of which decompose at the same rate. And so when you're using your compost, you 
do find those chunks of things that haven't decomposed. So um, do you have any thoughts or philosophies on what you use in the compost pile or if there's any limitations? So I, I compost in so many different ways. It's ridiculous, but I feel like that's because I'm Canadian and I'm very cold. <laughs> so I'll use an electric compost. I'll use worm composting and I'll use Bokashi in the winter. Um, summertime, I'm using like a regular compost pile, three-stage compost, like an insulated three-stage compost, and then a tumbler compost. Now, with that being said, all these forms of compost, I will stick to them um, in hopes of removing those less than ideal chunks. I, but I don't have any rules as to what can and can't go with it. So okay. I find um, I'll throw everything in, but because I'm sifting, I'll get out maybe some chunks. My biggest rule of composting and really the only rule I do have is no animal waste um, unless if it's like a herbivore. So carnivore waste is not a thing. So dogs and cats, I will not do. Um, and that's only because I've done like, I've done so much research on that sort of thing. And if you don't do it right, it can be very dangerous for yourself um, and your family. So that's the reason why I don't yeah. do it only because I don't have the time and patience to really make sure it's done properly. Um, and then my other rule is curing. So I am very adamant on curing of the compost, and I like to wait the full three months or whatever it is before I will incorporate it or put it on top of the soil. Um, okay. Those are like my two big ones. Yeah. yeah. I do do uh, even fish carcasses and heads and that sort of thing, but I do a trench composting with those. I don't do yeah. like a compost pile because my dog gets totally easy to pick it up and eat it. <laughs> I tried experimenting with fish a number of years back and and didn't have the wherewithal and the foresight to realize that I had a Labrador retriever who oh, thought yeah. that that was just an opportunity for free food. So everywhere I buried the fish and did was experimenting with the trenching, um, she dug up and ate all the fish. So, uh, oh yeah, <laughs> another reason. So for I say things. Yeah, yeah, I have her up. So I did my green bags and I put them like in an area that my dogs would like jump up to get into them. But the sniffers were going there. Yeah, and yeah, they know there's something there. <laughs> yeah, John, oh, yeah, Jude, yeah. John Jude's giving you a hey, saying you're one of the favorite five for advice. And oh, so, yeah, I recognize. I recognize John. That's great. Yeah. So for the, if you're just joining us, Ashley from the Gardening in Canada channel, who is packed with advice and actual scientific information based on research, a lot of research that you've actually been in involved with i think is is just absolutely fantastic jeremy saying both of my favorite garden creators in one spot that's always nice and uh and so we've we've talked a, a lot of options but heidi's wondering uh what is the best way to increase microbe life in the soil so if you had only one thing what would that one thing be um and you know Take sugar water out of the mix. If you're trying to increase the microbe life, beneficial to to grow your soil. Is there one thing that's really better than another? Oh goodness, this is going to get. I know. Trouble, I, but... I I can't think of a, a single one because I I draw a, a comparison to pizza. You know, if you put the same thing into your soil all the time, then you're making a cheese pizza. But if you really want your plants to benefit, then you should make the pizza with everything. You know, the pizza that's got the olives and the onions and the, the mushrooms, and that's what you're feeding your soil is the, the everything pizza as opposed to a cheese pizza. Yeah, I think if I was to pick one thing, uh, it'd be oxygen. Oh, there you go. Good. Yeah. But that's that, that's something that's gonna get you in trouble because that's gonna and I'll I need to say seventy five percent of cases the way to if you're not using like a tillage radish or a tap root um the way to increase oxygen is gonna be with a broad fork or with tillage unfortunately yeah that's a good My one yeah because... would be will go wild like absolutely wild if you if you till the soil 
yeah, without that oxygen, none of the rest is really going to be happening the way you want it to. No, so. yeah, it's such a catch twenty two because like toes are broad working, it's going to disrupt your fungal hyphae, so mycorrhizal. Yeah, but bacteria and nematodes and pretty much everything else is going to go crazy in that environment. Um, so even if it's a broad fork, I think yeah, oxygen, oxygen would be number one. Number two would be moisture. Within that soil, you know, not yeah. like drenched, but not bone dry either. Well, and you know, and that's important. And you know, I've I've shown it in videos and talked about you know the standard disc of good soil, and the oxygen and the the water are major components of yeah. good soil. Yeah, huge, huge. So um, if you didn't want to go for a tillage route to get the oxygen in, you'd have to do like intercropping with taproot and then leaving the taproot in place to decompose. So like a, a tillage radish, for example, is the icicle radishes would be one you could intercrop and then leave in place. Um, and then the other method would be like when you go to close a garden down in the fall, you just snip off at the base and you leave the roots yeah. um, would be the other mechanism for that. But yeah, oxygen, if I had to choose, it would be oxygen. I think That's people good. would be shocked if you've never tilled before. I think you'd be shocked at what kind of growth you get if you did a little bit of the good. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, you'd be like, holy man, <laughs> what happened? This is a new garden. <laughs> yeah. So I actually, this last year, um, and, am doing an experiment and basically let most of the native weeds grow and the intent because my soil is so compacted is for that root a lot of those native plants have pretty deep root systems and oh, yeah. just letting them grow wild didn't look good but now this year i've cut them all down and left the roots in with the idea being that those roots will have helped the soil uh, incorporate oxygen to to greater depths and now this next year i'm going to see if my plants actually are growing better after having done that so keep your fingers yeah. crossed yeah roots roots is the only way to do it if you're not going to tell for sure and and i grew a lot of daikon radishes as um cover oh, crops yeah. as well so sarah's oh, okay. wondering about um since we're then this kind of ties into the depth as well um can a garden fork be used in lieu of a broad fork? So a broad fork tends to have long, sturdy tines that you get in and that you can incorporate that oxygen, whereas a garden fork is much shorter. And so if you don't have a broad fork and you just have the garden fork, what do you say? Yeah, I would just do like a double dig, like a double pull. So like you stick in, pull, and then you stick in and pull. That makes sense so you can get to yeah. like that slightly uh further depth but yeah like a a, a classic garden fork it's gonna work just obviously make sure your tines are strong enough that it can take a pole without snapping yeah <laughs> Do the big thing. a composting yeah. fork probably wouldn't be good yeah it can be good so um i'm sorry to say your bird is being a little loud so there are some people that oh no have left oh. for the bird but Hopefully that won't create too big a problem and, and we'll get some people back, but just wanted to share that with you. It's not a big deal. Uh, Shanine saying, I saved my kitchen scraps, fruits and vegetables are a lot of sugar and they seem to wake up my compost pile. Uh, I cocoa hole in it through the crusty snow and put everything in it. So uh, we've been talking about the sugar and the sugar water but when you're talking vegetables and fruits do you make a differentiation i know that the the microbes probably don't between glucose and sucrose and all the different types of sugars as far as the composting or or its impact on the soil does that make much difference i don't know no no i don't think so i think it just it probably makes it a little bit more moist than greens. So moisture level, I think, would be the only thing that fruits would be increased. And so as long as we got that oxygen, well, speaking of dogs, mine just came to join me. Yeah. Um, and, and so the the garden tine 
method is a lot of work. I think that's why a lot of people use um, a, a broad fork to be able to get deep into the soil. And that's one reason why I went with daikon radishes over large areas so that I didn't have to do a lot of work. How often or, or do you even have a time frame as far as aerating raised beds? Because so often we think of the broad fork as the in-ground beds that we're aerating. And I think often people don't think about raised bed aeration. So uh, how, how should we be approaching the aeration of our soil in a raised bed? Yeah, I think um, like yours look like they're what a foot. Yeah, about a foot and a and a half, fifteen to sixteen inches, most of them. Yeah, so like um, classically speaking, uh, raised beds don't tend to get as compacted. I find so it may not be like a yearly activity for for them, um, but for. Uh, aerating them, I would just use a broad fork or a double dig method with hand trowel, depending on whether or not you can get on top of the bed. So like, I know, oh, she's being so bad right now. Um, so I know for like my bed, some of my beds I cannot get on top of at all. Um, it would be impossible to get a broad fork into. So those ones I could at yours, I'd be comfortable, yeah. you know, maybe broad forking. Um, but for the, the larger size ones, you can just a double dig. It would help um, if it has become compacted. And I think people will be shocked that first year after the snow lays on the bed and then they go in the spring and they're like, oh, yeah, what happened? It went from, from fluffy, it went down a foot. <laughs> it's just a very natural process for, for when you first get a, a bed established for sure. And so. and I, I love the idea of no dig gardening where you just add compost on every year, but but I get feet of snow and it compacts. And so I amend my soil, of course, but one of the reasons I amend it is because the process of amending the soil helps aerate the soil as well. And of course, you know, I still have people that say I shouldn't be doing that because I'm breaking apart the, the structure of the soil, but the oxygen is an important part of the structure of the soil. And so the, the no dig might work in an area where you're not getting a lot of that rain or snow to compact the soil. What would you suggest in an environment where you're having those compaction weather issues to try to maybe do more of a no dig and avoid disrupting the soil? Is there another solution other than like the roots that we were talking about? Um, so if you're, you're pretty set on no dig, uh, the biggest thing is making sure that soil does not go to bed wet. <laughs> it's really, really important. Um, and if it does go to bed wet, that it goes to bed very frozen before it gets anything piled on top of it. So uh, once the season starts kind of quieting down for the year, uh, the use of tarps or whatever it takes to keep that soil dry is is huge um, or wet and frozen. So if you know you can freeze the soil before the snow lands on it and it begins to compact it, then uh, go forward with that because uh, ultimately wet soil compacts easily and uh, quicker than uh, regular soil. So if we have a soil that um, is wet and then we get a heavy snowfall, you're going to have compacted soil in the spring. So I think that would probably be the biggest one. Um, yeah, if that's you're a pretty, good, good suggestion. Set on it. Yeah. But otherwise, the roots, uh, cutting off the base, kind of all that stuff, yeah. for sure. I also suggest mulching, of course, because the mulch will help dissipate some of that that rainfall that might compact. And, yeah. you know, the, the mulch will compact before the soil compacts in a snowfall. And so... Um, I kind of use my, I like to use straw mulch going into the winter and, and then after a, the snow melts, go out and fluff up the straw again to absorb some of that impact. But e even that doesn't do much difference. I'll, I'll still see, you know, a three or four or five inch settling of my soil over the course of a year, just because of all that weight of the, oh, yeah. the snow. My bed, like some of my beds right now, the one in front of my house. 
it's that how much can you just go on top of it so i'm like, oh, not wow. looking forward to <laughs> That's all not right. looking forward to you uh digging that up so yeah though not ideal we've got a for the first time in oh probably over six weeks I can actually see some of the ground in areas of my garden because the snow has been melting. Yeah. But we've got six inches forecast on Wednesday, so um, it's all over for you. Again. It's yeah. not going to change. So, and uh, a quick answer: Sunset Gazing is wondering if I got a haircut, and uh, yes, I did get a haircut last week. So, <laughs> thank you for noticing. Uh, and I had seen earlier. I think Llama Llama was asking. I I just got back from a trip yesterday. I went to to visit my son and his family down in Louisiana and they were doing a gender reveal party so I can announce that my grandson is going to get a sister oh, so that's that's, that's gonna be fun so we I actually already have um, three granddaughters so th th oh. th there'll be more on the way that we can get to this point so uh, okay let's get back to the show um, Bohemian Herbology is saying, I use weeds to till for me. No compaction, not being contradictory, but can be done quite easily in the in the Midwest. And uh, and like I said, that's that's what I've been doing over the course of the last year is just letting the native plants take care of the compaction. In my in my beds, I'll also at the end of the season decide whether to pull the plant or leave the plant, the roots at least, uh, based on how compacted that bed might have gotten over the course of the year as well. Yeah, I think um, like soil type really comes down to what method you're gonna use. So like if you have like a sandier soil or a sandy loam, you you likely won't have compaction the same compaction you will not have the same compaction issues as someone with a bulk density with like a clay or a clay loam so i that i think that's another really important uh part like what we talked about at the beginning is don't subscribe to just one modality like don't latch on to one and be like that's my answer because the answer may be different for you depending on like the soil type that you're dealing with right so right. um that's something to keep in mind yeah yeah and so uh, I think we've covered three or four of your top tips. Is, is there a tip that you're dying to share with us that we haven't talked about yet? I don't think so. so yeah, we, I think that's we, really nice. We, we've yeah, actually cool. covered an awful lot of stuff. Um, Sarah saying opinions on the best native edibles for tilling by weed roots method. Dandelions have that big tap root, but what about lamb's quarter? So um, I've got a lamp, lot of lamb's quarter, and that's, I actually let a lot of lamb's quarter grow. It doesn't have as big a root as the dandelions, but I let all my dandelions grow. And like I said, I use um, the daikon radishes. Are there uh, any plants that you might recommend for a vegetable gardener to grow that could do dual purpose, where um, like maybe a beet root where you could harvest the leaves um and then leave the root in place though it, that's kind of a squat and it doesn't always go below ground but you know uh are there plants that you could take advantage of the edibles because because the issue i have is when you leave the root in the ground it's no longer edible anymore so you're losing the root as an edible component but the plant itself could still be um yeah no i think for chickweed is probably the my favorite the one that i leave is chickweed um it's not necessarily maybe not the best root system but really good um in my opinion ground cover like a mulch cover okay. i find it particularly good uh, another one would be clover now i don't know if you eat clover as much but it is a nitrogen fixer so, and it's really yeah. nice and low to the ground. And pollinators love it, love it. Clover pollinators will come from all around to get their hands on that one. Um, and then plantain, I believe it's called. It's oh, like yeah. big, big leaves. Um, oh. that, that is an edible one. Chickweed's edible too, you can put it in salads or whatever. Um, but that's an edible, again, very low to the ground, so it's not necessarily competition for light, uh, but is a ground cover, weed cover. 
if you're looking for um, really good root action or like penetration, fescue. If you can get any form of mounding fescue okay. incorporated into your garden and then you just like cut it down, use the, the growth for mulch, fescue is, if you knew how deep those roots went, you would be shocked. Like oh, okay. I'm talking 10, 15 feet, like it's wild how, how wow. deep those, those roots go. Yeah. They're meant to be in the Great Plains. Like, you know where the Dust Bowl was, basically, yeah. in the U.S.? Yeah, Canada? I live pretty, yeah, so I live right on the edge of the Dust Bowl. Okay, so, like, that entire area kind of went to junk because the fescue was uh, demolished, taken out. And fescue actually pulls the water from pretty much groundwater levels up to the top and through the root system and how it, that's how it kept the moisture on those oh, higher levels and really helped with aggregation of the soil. And so the destruction of that fescue is actually what caused a lot of issues and, and caused the dust bowl. So fescue is a good one um, to actually incorporate into the garden. It, it works really, really nicely. So That's good. I, I didn't know that. We, we have a lot of uh, fescue in our lawns. I don't have a lawn because I'd rather grow native plants, but uh, a lot of fescue is used in this area because it does do well here in Colorado. And so yeah. I hadn't thought about that aspect of it. Drought, drought resistance, um, and just drought proofing even your garden and surrounding uh, soil areas for sure. Interesting. For sure, for sure. But mounding, mounding specifically, the mounding varieties are key. And so um, let's talk a little bit about um, legumes because um, you know we talked a while back about the wonderful nodules and and the, the uh, symbiotic relationship with the bacteria pulling the nitrogen from the air but if someone's trying to improve their soil and get that nitrogen and get those nodules how about the the plant should they let it reach the point where it is flowering and seeding and how does that impact the amount of nitrogen in those nodules yeah so uh what you're talking about there is what we call green manure it's like the term that we use in large scale farming uh so green manuring of a crop would not be bringing it to flowering you would terminate the crop before it gets there uh the termination process could be this basically like pesticides pesticides but uh, you probably don't want to use that in your garden, especially if you're intercropping. Uh, but it would be cutting, so like cutting it down or solarizing it in some way, um, that sort of thing. And then when you green manure, though, you would leave the plants in place. So like you would terminate the plant and terminate the plant growth, but then you would leave the upper biomass in place. So you would leave it on like in situ where you, you harvested it from. Um, and that's what you would want to do there. So, and that's the same with cover cropping. People will often think with cover cropping, you got to bring it to full maturity, and da da da. You don't, you don't do that either with cover cropping. You terminate it before it gets yeah. to that stage. Like the clover, so, that you know, clover is a great cover crop, but you want to mow it down before the flowers develop. Hundred percent. Yeah. If you're using any of that for green manures, um, nitrogen fixing, nutrient purposes, you always want to terminate. The, the crop before it gets to a flowering stage for sure for sure it's a lot of energy a lot of nutrients a lot of power goes into flowering and fruiting and all that sort of stuff it's quite taxing on a plant yeah. actually because because from a a um, botanical and biological perspective the plants are taking that nitrogen from the air for their own use to grow the, the flowers and the seeds. Yeah. And so, you know, if you it's let not it- there to benefit the tomato. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so the, the pea pod, you know, I, I, I've had this discussion with a lot of people who are growing peas and then letting the pea pods dry on the plant to save the seeds or the beans or whatever it is. And they think that they're doing a wonderful job to benefit the tomatoes in the soil when there really isn't, first off, the nitrogen isn't necessarily doing a whole lot of good for the tomato in the first place. But once that plant has flowered and fruited, uh, there's not much nitrogen left yeah. behind. 
And I think too with um, like common misconception is that the current year that there's a benefit from it, but those nodules and everything, it needs to, they need to decompose. Um, so until your nodules are decomposed or beginning to decompose, you're not going to see that nitrogen influx at all. So um, it's usually for something that's like a year or two down the road. So like in farming, we use crop rotation all the time. And so we advise our uh, producers and stuff to crop rotate. Um, and so how we do that or the way that we do that is with um, the, we'll usually plan for a heavy feeder a year after that legume cross and put in place regardless of the season. So if you're in an area that's a double crop area, like Texas, for example, where you do two crops a year, we would plan to have the heavy feeder, not the season after the legume, but the season after the legume. Does that make okay. sense? Um, yeah. And that, that comes down to the fact that it needs to be composed. So like the corns and the canolas and that sort of stuff. Well, and, and that plays in the traditional methods of crop rotation to anticipate that I, I, I've discussed this before in the home garden. If you're doing regular amending of the soil, then that you don't necessarily have that need for crop rotation. What are your views on crop rotation in the home garden? Oh, uh, I don't crop rotate. Um, so like the reason why I don't isn't because I don't see value in it. The reason why I don't crop rotate is because I live in an area like my house the way it's situated all the trees the buildings i don't i have very limited space with the sun if that makes any sense oh, yeah. um so in order for me to grow my tomatoes i have two beds that i can grow my tomatoes in and so because of that i have to keep them in those beds every single year regardless now if i had a disease issue and the disease issue was a soil-borne disease issue so like club roots or something like that then I would definitely consider a crop rotation. But if I'm not showing disease, I'm not showing signs of pests, um, or the signs of pests and disease I'm showing aren't soil related, they are uh, ambient type issues, yeah. I won't, I don't, or I won't crop rotate. Now, if I had the space that had the sun, I would crop rotate because it's just best practices. And I've seen on maybe on a large scale with gardeners and uh, our farmers and stuff total entire fields taken out by like one yeah. disease <laughs> and yeah. so when that happens it's like quite detrimental so like for example club roots are a real big issue um it affects canola well it affects grass pit species so mustard's canola that sort of thing and i know guys that just kept on rotating in canola despite the signs of club root being present and now they cannot grow canola on that field whatsoever because it's just not economical to do it anymore. So they're right. stuck to beets and legumes or whatever the case is. So, um, yeah, I think it, it's really, it depends on your situation, what you're going through and that sort of stuff. Um, and then obviously just going with your gut. If you, if you know that you can't grow tomatoes anywhere else because the sun, then just grow the tomatoes in the garden. And there's actually a whole, I guess, theory behind not rotating. So there's like a new theory behind not rotating. And I believe it comes from Eileen. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but the premise is, is that if you grow the same crop in the same bed every single year, that you're going to colonize the beneficials that that plant is calling out for. And so yeah. if you constantly have tomatoes in the same bed, you're going to colonize more and more and more microbes that benefit the tomatoes because that's all you have in that bed. So there's that side of the theory too, which I mean, if you don't have the bad guys colonizing, why not take advantage yeah. of, of the good guys? And I'm actually trying that. I, I built one area of my garden uh, that is my vegetable and pepper beds. And yeah. I'm, I've done it for two years now, but that's my intent is exactly that. The, the assumption, because you're right, a lot of this hasn't been necessarily tested or proved, but it's growing the same plants in the same place, but amending the soil to help replace any lost nutrients. And you see this all over the world, going back thousands of years in Japan and Korea specifically, who have gardening methods that are growing the same food in the same plot of land, and it's been the same crop for generations. So as long as you're yeah. replacing it, 
Yeah, like my tomato patches, like I do two, two tomato patches. Um, 10 years now, 10 years of the same veg. I haven't had any disease issues. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, it's doable. I think, well, I think the reason why I don't have any disease issues though is because I do mulch and then at the end of the season, I remove my mulch and then I oh. put new mulch down. Um, so I don't give the bad guys anywhere to hang out for too long, uh, which is huge when we're talking about blights and, and fungus, sure. more fungal issues. Um, and that's kind of my brainchild behind that. Um, and then replacing the mulch because I obviously don't want weathering and stuff to happen. Um, when stuff begins to melt, I don't want to run off and my soul going with it. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of what my idea is there. And that's out of convenience for me, but I guess we're going to see science experimental. <laughs> Gives me any benefit either. I, I have noticed like every single year, my water holding capacity in my soul has gone up in those two patches. And then I, my yields have gone up as Good. well. I don't check mine. So, and I run one conventional and one organically, which is kind of cool too. Um, nice. But yeah, yeah. Nice. Anyways. Can you speak to uh, disease in soil and how the microbes will neutralize that in time? Yeah, that's the uh, pest too. So bugs, slow-born bugs that are problems, uh, disease, whether it's fungal or bacterial. Uh, microbes, if you have the right balance of microbes, they'll, they're going to eat away at, at the bad guys. You just got to help colonize them. So if you know what the issue is, kind of look up what uh, counters it. By a lot. You'd be looking for biological pesticides is what it would be called, um, or biological pest management. Um, and you can find strains of it. Some of them are marketed strains. Others will be like, do this, do this, do this, and you'll you'll colonize the strain, whatever the case is, and then incorporating those in the soil. Typically speaking, a lot of disease, a lot of beneficials are only in that top two inches of soil because anything below that doesn't have the oxygen, it doesn't have the light, um, so it doesn't tend to do as well. And so when you add your beneficials, you don't have to, you know, dig or anything crazy like that. You generally just have to water them in and, and they'll do the job for you. So I think that that's the main thing. And then removing the food source of the bad guys. So if you know that the food source, you know, for your thrips, for example, is radish, baby radishes, then maybe trap crop with baby radishes and then uh, put adults in after that. So always removing the food source is the other key there. And so Barbara Grace is wondering, do you compost the mulch that you remove? Uh, so it depends on what the issue is. If it's an issue that doesn't overwinter in compost and it doesn't overwinter in compost conditions, then I do compost it. The only thing, and this is like so a great debate <laughs> uh, amongst soil scientists and plant scientists, is uh, powdery mildew. So powdery mildew, the word on the street for years has been that it overwinters in compost, it overwinters in mulch, it overwinters on pots, it overwinters in plant debris, it sticks to everything. Even if you compost it because it's a fungus, it doesn't die. It's, it's really resilient uh, in cold, it's really resilient in heat because that's fungal spores. They're one of those things that will outlive everyone. We're finding them yeah. in glaciers right now. Um, so because of that, if I have powdery mildew, I do not compost the powdery oh. mildew degree. And that's only because I've had, I used to have really bad powdery mildew issues. Um, I used whey, so fun fact, whey is shown to pretty much explode the spores for lack of a better term. Yeah. Um, so I've been using whey powder, like whey, I, I make my own whey. Um, and I spread that on the plant. So for anyone watching, if you don't want to make your own whey, milk is, yeah. has whey in it. It's just not as concentrated. Um, and that's where the milk theory comes from, is that it has the whey, so it counteracts the powdery mildew, but it's not as effective as isolating your whey. Um, so I've been using that. I also will put whey into my compost because I know it will get rid of the bad guys. And then um, I don't I don't compost the powdery mildew, and I have noticed that my powdery mildew issues have gone down. Where at okay. a minimum they happen later in the year. So. Okay. 
But that's maybe just my own thing because there's a whole group of people that are like, that's not true. Powder milk is destroyed in compost. And I'm like, but is it? Is it though? <laughs> are we sure? <laughs> Well, like you said, though, I tend to think that it's on the flower pots, it's on the the tools, it's on the beds inside and outside, and uh, and you're just never going to get rid of all of it. But you can no. try to reduce it. It's so insidious. It's like the worst thing ever. Yeah, yeah. and I I start my own plants from seeds. I built all my beds from scratch. I worked on my soil, and I got powdery mildew. And it's like with brand new soil, brand new beds. I didn't do anything wrong and I still got powdery mildew. So it's yeah. just everywhere. That's the worst. Downy mildew is the other one. Yeah. Um, that one doesn't overwinter. That one just travels on bugs. And every year I get downy mildew on my basil. Yeah. So, and there's nothing you can do about it, right? So, yeah. Well, let's go ahead and end there since we've been talking for an hour and a half. I could talk gardening all day long, it seems. Uh, I want to thank you, Ashley, for being on the show. And for those of you who may have come in late, be sure and check out the Gardening in Canada channel, one of my favorites. And I've got the link in the description below that you can click on to go check out the, Ashley's wonderful channel with some real scientific information from a real soil scientist. So I thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Okay. And I'll, I'll go ahead and stick you in the background now and say thanks to everybody. Of course, we're going to be back next Monday to do this all over again. Completely different topic. I think we might even have another guest next week to talk about some gardening topics. So hope to see you then. Thanks for participating and being such a wonderful community. Enjoy the rest of your gardening week, and I'll see you back same time, same place, next Monday. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.